friends, it is my privilege once again to say a few words to you on the eve of the 17th anniversary of our Independence Day. This would normally have been a day of rejoicing, but we are living in the shadow of the loss we have suffered by the passing away of our great national leader, Nehru, who left an imprint on our life and gave a new outlook to it. He strove to build a new future for India and gave to us a purpose in national life, and we should adhere to this purpose and dedicate ourselves to the task of accomplishing it. He gave us the ideals of parliamentary democracy, a non-communal state, planned development, sobriety in international affairs, and friendship among nations. There were many in our country who were impatient with what they called the unnecessary patience of Nehru, but being a Democrat, he wished to carry the bulk of the people with him in whatever he did. Our situation at home is not free from difficulties. Our achievement in the industrial sector is somewhat encouraging. It's a matter of satisfaction that at long last, work will begin on the Bocaro steel project. What is necessary is increased production in agriculture and industry, an equitable distribution of the products. Soaring prices of food grains and other essential commodities are causing great concern among our people. I am glad that the government is taking speedy and effective measures to check this rise in prices. We should face the present situation with concerted action. The members of all parties, I dare say, are interested in fighting this evil and so would cooperate and work together in increasing food production and organizing fair distribution of the produce. Personal rivalries and group factions have caused much injury to our progress and our good name. We should avoid them at all times, especially at a time like this when we are facing many problems. Lawlessness should be discouraged, and it is my hope that members of all parties would help in putting down any expression of violence. Democracy and lawlessness are inconsistent with each other. A recent report shows that food adulteration is being practiced on a large scale. Of all antisocial practices, there is none more heinous than adulteration of foodstuffs. The practitioners of this evil the hoarders, the profiteers, the black marketeers, and the speculators are among the worst enemies of our society. They have to be dealt with sternly, however well-placed, important, and influential they may be. If we acquiesce in wrongdoing, people will lose faith in us. The increase of corruption against which we are putting up a heroic fight is due to a considerable extent to our misplaced kindness and indifference to wrongdoing. Maudlin sentimentality is not to be confused with generosity or compassion. If we are soft to the anti-social wrongdoers, we'll be doing a great wrong to society itself. When we speak of a free, classless society, we mean that we should not use other people as tools for implementing our desires. Democracy strives to provide all individuals with the wherewithal and opportunity for self-expression and development. Artificially imposed barriers should be removed and the opportunities for self-development of all individuals should not be restricted. Whatever they are capable of by their genius and ability, all individuals should be able to manifest. We have still the problem of the hungry, the neglected, the poor and the downtrodden. We should avoid the extremes of colossal affluence and grinding poverty and whatever measures are necessary to bring about greater equality among our people should be attempted. We are attempting to bring about a revolution, economic and social, through consent and not through coercion. An essential element of socialism is the application of social purpose to our national life. Most of us suffer from a streak of laziness and a progressive society has little scope for lazy people. The other major problem which is engaging our attention today is that of national integration. We have been attempting to build a structure of society where everyone, whatever his tribe, race, religion and caste may be, has equal rights with every other citizen. Even when we lived as members of different tribes speaking different languages, 
and professing different religions, we all felt that we belonged to one whole. We acquired this sense through education and experience. By these processes, we recognize the human in members of all tribes, creeds, and communities. It is this process of consideration for other men and women that has been governing our conduct. It's the only safe way for emotional integration of our people into a single whole. When in 1962, we had the attack by the Chinese, all the people from Kashmir to Kanyakumari felt they were members of one whole. The great sorrow which recently engulfed our country on the passing away of Jawaharlal Nehru again demonstrated this basic unity of our people. Our country has today the representatives of all the living faiths of mankind, and they dwell together in peace until political indoctrination and personal ambition interfered with their harmonious living as members of a common fellowship. The one supreme is too vast to be comprehended adequately by the finite mind. And so all of our definitions are tentative and halting approximations and not the complete revelation of the mystery of Godhead. We recognize the diversity of pathways to the realization of the supreme, and so we rarely had violent religious quarrels. Unfortunately, today, we are here and there witnessing this phenomenon. Education, enlightenment, and economic opportunities for all are the ways by which these differences can be minimized and ultimately abolished. I hope the members of all communities will seek areas of agreement and cooperation and not of discord and dissension. It is easy to rouse the lower passions of human nature, but what we have to do is to enlist the higher qualities of understanding and appreciation of one another. We have had people following different cultural patterns, and all these, by action and reaction, brought about a common spiritual outlook. We also, from the beginning, spoke different languages and looked upon all these languages as vehicles of culture. Because our people speak different languages, it does not follow that they belong to different species. At 12th century, 1125 A.D., Kannada writer observes, Sarvagnam tadaham vande paranjyotis tamopaham pravritta yen mukha devi sarvabhasha saraswati. All the languages are the utterances of the great goddess Saraswati, and we should try as far as possible to understand the languages of others and the cultures they express. In our country, we have banned untouchability by law, but in practice it is still to be met with in many places. To root it out, law alone will not do. Education is necessary. The recognition of human nature leads to elimination of race prejudices and social discrimination. We are committed to a continuous process of self-education and self-discipline. Without them, we'll fall apart. History is a dynamic process and we cannot escape from it. If we try to do so, we'll fail to survive. No pride or prejudice should prevent us from accepting the purpose of time. The purpose that has not spent itself in the past, but moves onward to fulfillment in the future. Our future is larger and longer than our past. We can change history and are not merely to be changed by it. In the matter of industrial development, food production and such other vital topics, the country has to be treated as one whole and all parts of it should receive equitable treatment. We expect to have soon restoration of normal conditions in Nagaland. We hope that the present attempt at settlement of outstanding issues will succeed. We are trying to remove hate and violence from our national and international life. We cannot say that we have succeeded in this attempt though we are working for these ideals. We welcome the progress that is being made towards complete disarmament. But disarmament by itself cannot remove wars. We'll have to establish concepts and institutions that will adjust the minds of people to a world without arms. Let us open out our hearts to other people, understand their cultures, and feel a sense of oneness with all human beings irrespective of their race, politics, or religion. Each country, large and small, 
should have the liberty to live in peace and independence, thus enabling its people to prosper and enjoy the fruits of their own independence and pursue their own policy with regard to international relations. How far we are from this ideal is evident from the events in Vietnam, Congo, and Cyprus. Small nations must have a sense of safety and security, and big nations must behave with justice and generosity. We are pledged to the removal of race discrimination and colonialism in every part of the world. We welcome the emergence of many countries in Africa and Asia into freedom, and we earnestly hope that a few that still remain under foreign domination will soon gain independence. Our relations with our neighbors, especially with Pakistan and China, are not very satisfactory. Our differences with these countries have cost us and them a great deal, have hurt us and them a great deal. We shall not relax our efforts until these differences are settled with honor and dignity. In some of our neighboring countries, people of Indian origin are subjected to harsh treatment. Their contributions are forgotten. I hope these irritations will be removed in the near future. A few of our people, when they go abroad, behave sometimes with an unnecessary and unwarranted sense of superiority, and this has not made us very popular in some foreign countries. It is essential for us to conduct ourselves, both at home and abroad, with decency, dignity, and humility. These are not qualities which we can acquire from textbooks. These have to grow from within. Education of the human mind and heart is the only way by which we can grapple with human relations. Our duty to the world today is to work for peace. Talk of peace is not a mere sedative slogan. We can save the future only by working seriously for peace. Our whole age is in arms against the temper of violence. Yet in many parts of the world, we come across the will to death, the will to destruction, the will to settle disputes by force of arms. The world is torn by many and difficult problems. We must not be deterred by them. Rather, we should look upon them as opportunities greater than any we have yet had for service to man's well-being. A true leader must guide his nation beyond the moods and movements of the general public. He should raise the public to a higher quality of consciousness, a higher level of feeling, a higher degree of enlightenment. Sensitivity and vision of the future move civilizations forward. The stakes are high and the prospects are bright, and they should challenge our best and most imaginative effort. It's a heritage of hope and a vision of the future that have come down to us from the past. Nehru, who gave to the profession of politics a high dignity, himself felt that many promises which he made were still unfulfilled, and he had a long distance to go to his goal. It is for us now to do our best to further the unfinished tasks that he left behind.